Welcome everyone. It's so chaotic outside right now, but in here we get to worship an awesome God. 1 John chapter 5 verse 14 says this, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. So please, turn off your cell phones. Settle in, let's get ready to worship and hear an insightful message. We're so excited that you're here today. Good to see you guys this morning. You guys ready to praise God? 
All right. Can you do this? That's my sore finger. I just wanted to make sure everybody else felt the same as I did. All right. Go ahead. So 
But God, we raise our voices to the Lamb who is enthroned as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. Lord, you sit at the right hand of God the Father, the Almighty, and, and someday you're coming again to glory, and you will judge the living and the dead. And we submit ourselves to you today, Lord God, because you are that King of kings, the Lord of lords, the ruler of all creation. We submit ourselves humbly before your throne this morning, giving you honor and praise, Lord God, for who you are. There is nothing that we can give that you're not deserving of. Lord God, all that we have, all that we all that we can possibly give, Lord God, it's not even enough. But we come to give you glory and honor and praise because you are the King. 1 Peter 2, 9-10 says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, who once were not a people but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. Lord God, we are grateful that, that that's who we are, the holy priesthood, the royal priesthood, priesthood, a holy generation. Oh God, we are thankful to you. If you guys have a prayer request this morning, we do want to have the opportunity to pray for you. So feel free to come on down. There will be somebody down here to, to pray with you, to, to take your needs to the Father from whom all good things come.
We look forward to that day, Lord God, where we can be completely and totally and yours, just yours, Lord God. Lord God, we thank you for welcoming us into your kingdom. We thank you for giving us, Lord God, that which we do not deserve, but um, we thank you for that. Through your amazing grace, we can be saved. You are glorious and greatly to be praised. We're actually going to be taking communion in just a second here. And it is amazing grace that we have been forgiven, that we've been set free, that we don't have to earn it on our own. I think sometimes, especially if you've been a Christian for a long time, it is easy to almost take it for granted because we're so used to it. And forget just how wonderfully freeing the news is. And so this morning as we take communion, I'm going to read a very famous section of Scripture, especially one Pastor Jeff uses a lot. I'm going to start in 1 Corinthians 11, 23. I'm going to be reading from the ESV, so it won't be the same as your pew Bibles. It says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty considering the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. And he continues on. This morning, if you, Pastor Doug and the worship team have another song, I'm going to ask them to play for a moment. Can we just take a second and prepare our hearts this morning instead of just rushing into something like it's a check mark? Let's just take a moment. I'm not saying if you have sin in your life, you need to sit here and if you don't repent right this second, God's going to strike you dead. But if God's speaking to you about something you need to surrender to him, sin or not, this would be a great opportunity for a moment. Let's just, maybe you've had some bitterness in your life that maybe you just need to take a moment. Let's just prep our hearts to just actually realize we are participating in one of the few things Jesus said, do this with an ordinance, leaving us an ordinance. Water baptism and communion is such an important thing. It's a holy moment. It's not just eating crackers and drinking juice. So let's take this moment and just seek the Lord for a second and then we'll take communion together. Lord has promised good to me His word my hope secures Thee will my shield and portion be as long as life
with us we'll be spending eternity with him so in part not only are we celebrating what God did but we're celebrating God's faithfulness knowing that means he fulfilled his promises to come so this morning if I can have our deacons come up we're going to pass out communion we practice an open communion here meaning that you don't have to be a part of Sunrise Church you don't have to be a member you don't have to to have anything more than a relationship with Jesus. So if you are a Christian, you, you said, yep, I, I have a relationship with Jesus. I've asked him in my heart. You can participate with us this morning. And we take it all together. So in just a second, as they finish getting position, we're going to have you come up. Just grab the elements and then take it back to your seat. And please wait a moment before you take communion. And we'll participate together. All right. You may come up and get your elements. Thank you. Oh, and the 
sacrifice that you gave on the cross of Calvary. Lord God, we thank you with every breath that we take. Lord, we just praise and give you glory. Let us share it. Let's take the bread together. Amen. And Lord, we just thank you for your shed blood, according to your word, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. And the perfect land that you were, Lord God, your blood covers our sin, and this juice represents your blood, Lord God. And I just pray that we never take it for granted, and that we always remember your sacrifice. In Jesus' name. Amen. from one thing to the next, Lord, and we just just want to enjoy your presence for a second. Just linger a little longer. Not always feel like we're in a rush, Lord. In the chaos of day-to-day -day life where it seems like we're running always five minutes behind to the next meeting and always get stuck in the traffic for a second and we don't have time for it, Lord, just to have the moment to just linger in your goodness and your love, your presence here. But we are just grateful this morning. We are so thankful that not only did you save us, but Lord, you actually want to be with us. You want a relationship with us. Lord, and I realize for many that is just not only mind-boggling, but it's hard to to feel like we really can see and hear from you. So, Lord, today I ask that you would give us fresh vision to see what you're revealing to us. Fresh ears to hear what you're speaking to us. That our minds would be open and clear, Lord. That it wouldn't be clouded with doubts and fears. But, Lord, we would be able to, to clearly understand what you're showing us. That our hearts would be soft and tender. To be that good soil that you spoke about in that parable, that when you speak and give us seeds of life and truth, that it would not be stuck in rocky soil that's the seeds being stolen away, that it wouldn't be stuck in soil that is just shallow and that we get excited for a second and the minute something's difficult, we give up and walk away, nor that it would be amongst the thorns and that it would be choked out by the cares and concerns of this life, but Lord, it be good soil in our heart. That, Lord, produce that 30, 60, 100-fold harvest. Lord, I ask that for us this morning. Lord, that our hearts would be the place that just springs forth your goodness, your life. The fruit of your spirit would be evident in us. That people around us, we wouldn't have to go around saying we're a Christian, but they would know we're a Christian because they see your spirit in our lives. 
so Lord, we just thank you that this morning we're not just here for another lesson. We're not just here because it's Sunday and it's 10.30 and this is what we do. But we don't take communion just because it's the next check mark on the first day. But Lord, we are here because you're changing us to truly be like you. And so this morning, we just surrender our lives and just thank you that that transformation is happening. When we don't feel like it, it's happening. When we have some stumbling blocks in the road, it's still happening. Lord, you don't give up because we make a mistake. Lord, you are there picking us up. And so this morning, I just speak to you if you're listening to me online or in this place. And you feel like you keep tripling and stumbling. You keep feeling like you're never good enough, that you'll never get past this thing in your life. Let the, don't give up, but it's not that you don't fall down, but the righteous man may fall down six, seven times, but he gets up again every time. So, Lord, I just speak for that resiliency and perseverance that we would get up and not grow weary in doing good and seeking you, Lord. We just release that into our lives this morning, that your spirit would seal it, and that this would be just a proclamation that we receive from you. In your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 My children, I just want to assure all of you that you are mine. First, because I created you. Secondly, because I sent my son to be put in your place so that you can come in his place to share a a room in the throne, in the ruling, in authority. I am preparing you to become first my child. So whether you are young or older, I'm still calling you to be to take your place as an inheritor, uh, someone who has a part in the kingdom. But first, you have to be born, born again, just like I told Nicodemus. He was already religious. He was already older and he had to be born again and so i pray that today before you leave this place you settle that in your heart that this is by the holy spirit and i'm pouring it out just like when they were in the upper room it wasn't like one or two it wasn't a trickle it was a mighty outpouring and that is not different today I am still generous with you. You are my children, and I want you all to have a part of it because I am coming back, and I'm not coming back meek. I am coming back as a ruling king. So you need to know the times. You need to know that first you need to be born again into the spirit. But those of you that have been around, you, you need to step it up and come in as adult children that claim the inheritance, no longer need... Uh, someone to babysit you, but you have to step it up, come in, and take those places where you need to make decisions. Uh, maturity in the kingdom of God. The time is near when I'm coming back for my ruling body. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, Sir. The Lord is good. He's always good. Wow. I, while you were talking straight, I thought of a, a vision that somebody had. It wasn't me personally. I'm not doing a Paul, Paul thing where he's like, I know a man. But I, I, I heard uh, this gentleman share a vision he had. He said he was, his name's Grant Cook. Kids can go. Thank you. Sorry. Kids can go. Um, and if you're, yeah, so if you missed that, your Sunrise Kids, this is your time to go and hear something amazing and have fun. And if there's Legos going on, I might sneak down there later. So I'm just saying, I love Legos. But I, this vision came to mind. And what it was is, it was Graham Cook. And if you know who Graham Cook is, and you might prejudge everything I'm about to say, but I just want to give credit where, you know, so you know who it is. You can go listen to it yourself, because I'll probably butcher it, because it's it just came to mind. And he said he would go around traveling, and there was always these three hecklers everywhere he went. Everywhere he went. There, it didn't matter where the city was. It didn't matter the time, the anything. Three hecklers almost always in the front row or very close to the front row. And they, were, they would show up with signs criticizing him. They would sit in the front and, and criticize him and, and just heckle him and do everything they could. They tried to tell people, don't listen to this guy. He's a fraud. And they were constantly just basically a thorn in his side. And 
He was praying, you know, God, take this away from me. I'm sure he quoted Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 12, and he's like, just take this thorn from my side. I pleaded with the Lord three times, and finally the Lord showed him a vision, and he brought him into heaven, and he said he was sitting in the throne room with the Father. And I can only imagine how amazing and glorious that would be. And he said he's there, and, and I think sometimes we, because it is easy to think of God in a solemn way, we, we forget there's joy in heaven. It's exciting. It's wonderful. It's pleasant. It's not, oh, yes, there's, there's the trembling before the Lord in some sense, but God is our Father, a loving Father, and a good Father you shouldn't be terrified of when you go into His presence. So there's this joy, and, and Graham's talking about how there's this excitement, and, and he's having a great time with the Father, and all of a sudden the Father's like, you want to see something amazing and beautiful? And he was like, of course. And, and so God has these angels roll in this giant block of marble, this gorgeous marble. I mean, I'm sure colors and ways we can't even imagine because it's in heaven. And he's in there, and there's this big old block of marble, and all of a sudden, th- you know, three pairs of hands start chiseling away at this marble. And they're chiseling away, and God's like, cheer them on. And so he's, I'm not British, so I won't be able to do it right, but you know, come on, chap, that's good. You know, we can't change your mind. You're like, no, no, get into it. He says, so he's standing on the throne, just hooting and hollering and cheering them on, and they're carving away. And he said, you want to see what it is? He was like, oh, yeah. And so they turned around this marble, and it's this piece that was sculpted to look like him, Graham Cook. And he's like, oh, my gosh, he's just absolutely gorgeous. I mean, just, just amazing and stunning. And he said, would you like to thank the, the artist? Who are doing that? He said, "Oh, I love that opportunity." And so God had the the three people who were being used, the three pairs of hands, come out, and it was those three hecklers. And all of a sudden, God's basically revealing to him that the very people he's asking to get rid of, God was using to shape him into something that God had planned. And it changed his attitude about those three hecklers. All of a sudden, he would see them, and he would go up and like, thank you so much. You guys are always here buying tickets and, and being a part of what's going on. And you, here's some notebooks. Take some notes. You know, it, just, it just completely changed his attitude. He said within a few you know, services, they were no longer showing up. And I can't guarantee if you try your attitude change towards the people in your life, you feel like that or the situation, automatically it's going to change. But I do want to just encourage this morning... And it will tie into what Pastor Jeff is going to be sharing in the video. Although I didn't plan this thing that, to say that, it just when Sharita had that word back there, I feel like God just brought that because that's so helpful, so encouraging. And so before we transition, we have a couple of things I want to talk about. First of all, before I go on, if you're a guest with us this morning, thank you for being here and, and worshiping the Lord with us. And I hope that you feel the presence of God and everybody to walk away feeling like you got something from him. But while I'm talking for the next few minutes, there's a get to know you card sitting in the seats in front of you, just in the back pocket there. If you could just take a minute to fill that out. We just want to say thank you for being here. Share a little bit of who we are with you and maybe get to know you a little bit. And when you're after service, because we don't pass plates or anything right now because of COVID uh, policy still and because of the renovations going on, the walls are kind of bare. We don't have the normal box I pointed out. So if you could just maybe flag me down after service, I'd like to, to say hi, welcome you, and personally just greet you, and I'll take that card. And if you don't feel comfortable filling out the card, but you want to meet me anyhow, feel, I'd love to meet you still. Secondly, I want to talk about giving for just a second. I had a conversation yesterday with somebody, and they asked a really interesting question. They said, why do we give? I'm like, why do we give to the church? And I know I could get up here and give biblical answers, and I can give all the the stuff, and I know what I've said many times over the years, and I, I want to give a different answer like I did to this individual, because this person knows and has listened to me a lot, and if you guessed it was my wife, it's because it is my wife, and so we're at lunch, and she's a very inquisitive person, likes to ask tough questions, I think she tries to figure if, if she can stump me, and I said, what if the only reason we gave, we got nothing in return, but the only reason we gave was so other people could hear about Jesus. God never blessed us back. He never brought increase. We saw no fruit from it in our own lives. The only fruit that came from it is other people know about Jesus. And this morning, I'm not going to give you an answer. I'm not going to tell you where that conversation went. I'm going to leave that with you as we get ready to have an opportunity to give and just say, if nothing else happened in your life and you gave, but people were hearing about Jesus and had a chance for their eternity to change, would it be worth it? And that, to me, you have to answer that for yourself. For me, I I obviously say yes because we give. So there's three ways you can give. 
and I believe there's new slides and new numbers. So if you go to try to text the old number, which is 77977, you're like, I always punch that number and give that way. That will work for now, but we have a new number coming and it's right on the screen. So if you would like to give, that new number is the one number we're switching to. So feel free to text SUNRISE, lowercase s, capital S. I tried both, they both work, so you don't have to be all concerned about proper spelling. Just S-O-N-R-I-S-E, text SUNRISE to 833-345-5945, and that will give you the prompts to give. You can use the offering envelopes in front of you. There is no offering box in the back, so there's a slot right on the other side of the sound room. I realize if you're like, I'm new here, I have no idea what you're talking about. There's no easy way to describe it besides for go through those double doors right here in the center. Turn to the right. To your right, there's a little gray like box thing with a slit. Just drop it in there. And that will be secure there. Or you can use the app or, or the website has a donate tab. You can click that. With that being said, there's a quick announcement video. And then Pastor Jeff actually has a message for us from Moab, Utah. Crikey, we're here in the middle of the jungle, and there's VBS coming. So if you would like your kids to be part of this, you need to sign them up as soon as possible. VBS is almost here, and we are so excited to minister to your entire family. So we need your help. We'd like um, everybody to pick up at least one of these from the Welcome Center today and share it with someone in your community. Invite them. Invite them here to the jungle <laughs> to come be part of our vacation Bible school from June 21st to the 25th. And if you're interested in volunteering during that time, you can come next week, June 13th to our VBS volunteer meeting here in the kids classroom that doesn't quite look like this jungle, but sometimes it does. The kids are like monkeys. Um, but come help us out. We would love to have you with us. Hey church family. All right, so unfortunately, we were not able to do the Mother's Day photo booth. But for Father's Day, on June 20th, right after service, we are going to have a photo booth. If you have any questions, come see me after service or come see Miss Christine. We'll talk to you guys later. Hello. We're trying something a little different this morning. Rather than the normal setting that you're used to seeing me in, we're trying a remote sermon series, Pastor Brian and I. He is uh, going to be dealing with the glory of God there in the pulpit. I'll be dealing with it on location here and at the Grand Canyon. And you could not ask for a neater place. Now, you don't get a huge view behind me. Um, that's several hundred feet up there. It's called Skyline Arch. I'm at Arches National Park in Moab, Utah. I'm about 1,580. 83 miles away from you there in Howell. And uh, we're going to have an opportunity to talk about the different aspects of the glory of God over the next four weeks. And I'm excited to be able to see you a few of the things that, that I see. Um, you'll be able to see those with me and, and experience what God is doing. The fact of the matter is, I don't think that the greatest way sometimes to look at God's glory is necessarily with physical creation. It's impressive. Here we have uh, amazing sandstone. Here we have, uh, you know, the, the beauty of nature all around. But I think that that's really kind of a bit of divine graffiti, if you will. It's God's way of saying, look at my creativity. Look what I can do. Given the time and the energy and the power that God has, he can create some absolutely amazing scenery. But it isn't really oceans and seas and trees and caves and arches that show that the best. It shows us something, Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. All of people in nature can see the things that are going on around us and say, Wow, something bigger than me created this. But I don't think God's greatest glory is seen in this. I think, honestly, his greatest glory is seen in us. You see, we are very different than nature. And I'm going to get to that in just a little bit. But we're different than nature. And God has a way of working in us, putting the puzzle pieces together in an amazing way. So that what comes out of us is beauty that's even greater than this. So I wanted to take this opportunity this morning to show you just a few things that explain a little bit about what's going on around me and then see how God moves in our life in the same way and even a more ama amazing way. 
All right. So first I want to tell you a little bit about the story of the stones today. Every time man creates an arch, we build it from smaller objects, stone or steel, wood or concrete. Humans take whatever is at hand and put it together according to a plan. We start with an empty space and we hope after a lot of work to end up with something beautiful or worthwhile at the end and, and people can see it and go, wow. God's story kind of goes in these are rocks in the reverse direction. God starts with stone. In this case, it's Entrada Sandstone. I really don't care if you think it was all created on day three of creation 6,000 years ago, or whether you think that it took millions of years. Scientists who don't pay any attention to, of course, what the Bible says, claim that this sandstone, and most all sandstone, was formed on the bottom of seas. It was all the sand, all the junk that washes up on the beach. And because of overburden and heat and pressure, those shifting grains, weak grains of sand turned into, formed into sandstone. Well, maybe. And then what you see around us, eventually near this place that would be called Moab, Utah, this sandstone formed in, in thick, thick layers. Now sandstone is funny stuff. It's heavy, it can bear weight. There are entire buildings that the faces of those buildings are made of sandstone. It, it handles weight very well, but it doesn't handle tension or shearing forces. It's a bit like nature's version of a brick wall. Each brick itself is not that impressive or strong, but together it can carry a ton of weight and do amazing things. But sandstone doesn't hold up very well against erosion. Even in dry places like Moab, it does rain. Water softens the cohesion, the connection between the grains of sandstone. It takes time, but the stone weakens. It isn't granite after all. Then the wind blows, and around here, let me tell you, the wind seems to blow all the time, and it carries with it other bits of sand. Like sandblasting a car, the wind scours away bits of the sandstone at the surface of the rock face. Eventually, a wall of sandstone is cut off from the rest of the hill it is a part of, and the water and the wind can get in at both sides. At this point, it's called a fin. For these fins, it seems like the erosion then begins to set in at the lower central section of the rock face, and it begins to thin. Give it enough time, wind, water, and the stresses of rock expanding and contracting due to temperature changes starts to open a hole in the rock face, and the beginning of an arch is born. It doesn't have to be big, and it's never impressive in the beginning. It's just a hole. I, I think we've all seen just a hole, a hole in the roads, a, a hole in our wall at home. But time and the processes of nature wear away at that rock until more and more of the stone is peeled away. And eventually some of the arches begin to look like the one behind me. Tall, impressive, powerful, and graceful, and sometimes a little bit scary. You kind of want to walk on it, but that is seriously illegal. and <laughs> They don't let you do it. And yet these arches bring, I think, a couple of million people, one and a half to two million people a year, drive all the way out here to Moab, Utah. I came here, my daughter Alyssa and her husband Brandon came from Marquette, along with millions of other people to see what isn't in our own area, right? We don't have arches in our backyard. If we did, maybe we wouldn't be all that interested. But today, we get a chance to see what we have not seen before. They're different and it makes them interesting. Now, at the risk of saying something that you already know, I'll say this, the rocks don't know the process is happening. The rocks know nothing, and only the most careful study and observation from scientists can even tell which rock faces may be weakening and, and starting to approach arch formation. Most of it happens in places where people don't go, and on rocks they don't care to see, but it happens anyway. Can you imagine for just a moment what a rock might think about if it could think about the process? Here it is, it's a nice compact hillside, welded to all the other rock in the area in a big rock community. It hasn't gone anywhere in so long it can't even remember going anywhere. Then the water begins to seep in through the stone. This is new. It's a little disturbing, but so what? With all that rock, all that support around you, so what if the water creeps through the cracks in the porous places in the sandstone? If I get a little weaker, I've got all the support of my rock neighbors around me. 
until I don't. Because eventually what will happen with this sandstone is, as the fin begins to form, parts of the rock face will begin to break away. Maybe they're swept away in a flash flood. Maybe they just wear away over time. And eventually, rather than being a whole thing, there's an area here called the petrified dunes that are pretty cool. They're not impressive, I mean, except in their own desolate way. But they're big humps of rock. And all of a sudden, what, what is a hump, a compact area, becomes shaved off and thin and cut off from all of the support and all of the people, if you will, all of the other rocks around it. And there's suddenly a sense of loss. Now, the rock has no sense, no concept, that it may be becoming more interesting looking. It doesn't care whether people stop and take pictures of it. It has no sense of history to say, man, in the future, I am going to be quite the rock. And it wouldn't care if that happened. You see, something terrible and unprecedented has happened. If you're a rock, if you could really think about what that felt like, your neighbors have been cut off from you. You're alone. Wow, lonely is a terrible place. Perhaps that new arch might look around and, and see the ruins of other bits of rock that had formed arches in their time and then fallen from erosion and think, yikes, I don't want that to happen to me. That's a terrifying situation. And maybe, just maybe, that arch would start to ask questions. Hey, why would this all happen to a nice arch like me? What's going on here? Why would God take a beautiful part of his creation, all the strength of the stone, and wear it away and create rubble? That's an awful thing to have happen. Now, unlike rocks, for which you have to stretch your imagination in order to consider them feeling anything, we know that we feel almost everything that goes on in our own experience. If we're honest, we feel more than really what happens. We fear things that will never happen. We make more out of small events than they're really worth. We underappreciate good things, and we're very, very worried about the tiniest bad things. We wonder why all these things happen to us. I said that there are lessons to the sandstone, and I am right. We're a bit like sandstone ourselves, obviously not at the molecular level, but at the emotional level. So many of us think that we are so strong and solid. We make plans and make them work out. We outlast trials. We decide we're not going to bend or break. Whether that's pride or dedication, I'll leave that choice up to you. Then life hits us with various forces and weakens us. Sin, choice, toxic relationships weaken us. People we thought would always be next to us walk away and leave us lonely and questioning. Suddenly some crisis pops up and we find that we're the first to crumble when the impact comes. And we turn into this pile of sand that can't hold up anything. And that realization makes us feel even weaker. Like sandstone, we can look strong on the outside and be weak on the inside. We're worn away by erosive forces, but rather than wind or water, this might be fear and worry and insecurity and criticism. When we feel like we lose part of ourselves, we just don't know what to do. You know, we start to blame other people. We can lash out. Have you ever done that? You take a moment and you start lashing out at the people closest to you, friends and family who care about you the most, and yet all of a sudden you're, you're all over them because they're convenient targets. Or maybe you choose to be the ones that lash out at grocery clerks and law enforcement officers and bank tellers because you figure you're not going to be close to them and you don't have to go home to them. And so you kind of vent yourself uh, on their experience. Hard way to live. Some people blame God. I've run into so many folks who say that they're atheists and the reason that they do is because somewhere in the past there was an issue where they felt God was supposed to save them from something, supposed to rewrite history to make their world a better place. They felt like this rock fin, that weakening, that loss. And when, when the world didn't stay together the way it was supposed to, they figured, well, there's no God to pay attention to. There's nobody to reach out to. And so I won't believe at all. I'll write my world in a totally different way. Now, when I look at the beauty in the arches, when I look at the amazing sandstone, when I consider these lessons, that's exactly why when I thought about coming here, I wanted to preach this message from this place. Maybe not right here under Skyline Arch, but somewhere. You see, the passage of the day is Romans 8, 28, 29. It's a familiar passage. It says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, 
that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Imagine, again, being that rock around me. It feels the weakening, the stresses, the collapse. Its world radically and inexplicably changes, and it doesn't know why. It doesn't know what will come of it. But we do. We see these amazing rocks, and I know that a few of you have seen my pictures on Facebook, and you've commented about how you've been here and you've loved it, or how you wish you could come out here with me. A few even, oddly enough, liked the pictures for their own sake, and I am not a vid videographer or a photographer at all, but even I can't mess this up too badly. But what am I talking about? It's beauty. There are rocks all over this park. In one place, as I said a moment ago, there are petrified sand dunes. They have a desolate beauty. You, you wouldn't want to build your house in the middle of them. Um, but you kind of look and move on. And then there's this rock that stands so strong and imposing, these walls, these sheets of sandstone. It looks a little bit like something out of the movie The Martian, which, by the way, was filmed in the nation of Jordan in rocks that are very much like these here in Moab. That rock stands in these huge, imposing, strong vertical cliffs. But the rocks that gave the park its name are the arches. And this is stone that has gone through the most severe shaping. More has been weakened, lost, cut away, and collapsed than any other form of rock in the park. In the middle of the seeming ruin is something beautiful, something worth seeing. I have seen so much of that kind of glory of God on this trip. There are incredibly desolate places here in Utah where only sagebrush or a few stunted trees grow. You almost feel sorry for the lonely little trees. Why did they end up out there? Why couldn't they be someplace where life was easier, where they could have rain, where they could enjoy other trees nearby? Yet those specks of green shout out for attention in the middle of all that red and brown. In their isolation, they are unique and precious. They're testimonies of life. The stones here in their near ruin are testimonies to the creative power of a God who makes beauty even out of erosive destruction. And God shows his glory the best, in my view, when he does that not to rocks, but to people, to us. We face so many things that we hate. We fear these times. We resent them coming our way. We don't understand why God allows them. I mentioned a while back that God creates something new with these times, but here he creates something beautiful with them. He takes the broken parts of our life, the stuff that seems to have fallen away, the lost relatives, the lost communications, and he creates a story out of it that is absolutely amazing and points to the beauty and sustaining power of his life. In stories like this, we could see the drug addict who finds Christ the broken family that finds hope, the needy person who finds his source. God takes this puzzle of pain and makes out of it something worth looking at. Someone who can tell the story of God's goodness, a story that you never think could come from that person, and yet it often does. And that's scriptural too. Beauty for ashes, remember? God looks into our life and he takes all of this brokenness and miraculously, amazingly, puts it together into something amazing. I don't know what you're going through today. Perhaps you face pain. I would love to give you comfort. I mean, isn't that what we usually want when we're hurting? But I'm not always sure that comfort is the thing that we always need. Instead of comfort, I want you to look at what you're afraid you might lose. I want you to see all the pain that you pass through. I want you to recognize that you may not have even the hint of a successful plan. You know, you have no idea how to get out of where you're at. Look at the rock in your life and all of the wearing away that's going on and all of the threat that's taking place. You don't know what's going to happen next. But we serve a God who does know. We serve a God who is awesome at creating amazing things, amazing works out of trouble and disaster. He's great at creating beauty where we do not expect to find beauty. He looks to share a story with the rest of the world that's lost. He sees, he knows, he cares. Look in the scripture at all the things that he created, all the things that he worked through the story of Joseph or Abraham or Peter. In so many biblical cases, God made something incredible out of the puzzle of pain. 
I really wish there was another way. I wish it could always be formed out of pleasant, wonderful, happy experiences. And I know that God does build with those blocks too. But we expect good things to happen there. It's like looking at that green forest and seeing all the individual green trees. Nothing stands out. Nothing grabs our attention. Remember I said that the little, you know, thrawn, scrubby tree in the forest, I mean in the, in the desert, just jumps out at you and you see it. When painful things happen, God brings something out of those. We think, wow, look at that. Look at what he can do. You see, that's glory too. Trust that the one who can make all of this as an afterthought can make something out of your own story, no matter how much it might hurt right now. Don't run away. You can be stronger than rock. You have the Son of God living in you. And if you don't, you can. You can right now. That's an awesome story too. Pastor Brian, take us home. What's that? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, well, you know, they call me Speed Racer for a reason. As Pastor Jeff just said, before we go into the, the altar call for those who are saved, if you don't know Jesus, and that's a theme that's come up a couple of times today, I just want to take a minute and speak to you. Whether you're in this room, maybe you're online listening, but I want to just take a minute and talk to you about what we're talking about. Because I think sometimes Christianity is believed to be just a religion. It's just a, it's a belief structure that believes in doing good and be nice to people and help people. But those are all overflows. Those are all things that happen as a result of what we have in Jesus. And doing good is never going to be enough to be saved. Never going to be enough. You'll never outdo enough bad. It's not a scale where God says, hey, I, I see you have a thousand pounds of good deeds. You got 800 pounds of bad things you've done. So you're, you're going to make it. You're doing all right here. I, I, abstract numbers, right? So, and going to church isn't enough. I just want to just take a moment here and just explain that what salvation is and not get mixed in noise. Going to church, reading a Bible, what am I, I've, I've seen people who are atheists, diehard atheists who can quote the Bible better than probably the majority of Christians. They don't believe in it, but they sure do know it so they can argue and debate. It says even Satan, even the demons believe that God and, and Jesus, I mean, it's not enough to say, oh, I believe God's out there, or the man upstairs, or the big guy. There has to be a point where you decide, I want to give my life to Jesus. What that means is, comes to a place where you say, if you want to, you guys can play, just so you don't have to hang out with me for no reason. Go ahead, just tell them soft. So, I, like, I, I didn't want to just be like me on stage and have these amazing people behind me for doing nothing. So, if you are at a place where you're like, you know what, I, I know God's real. If you don't believe God's real, I realize that's another question. But if you believe God's real, and you're like, you know what, I realize that I think he's real, I think it's important, but I'm just kind of living on my own. I just, I'm just at a place where I don't know for sure I'd go to heaven. I'm, I'm just trying to do it on my own. I've, I'm grabbing the weight and doing it on my own. I'm just, I'm just trying to be a good person. It's not going to be enough. I had a, a mentor who said, who explained it very well. He said, it'd be like being on a plane. And I know those are actually operating again. So it'd be like being on a plane. The captain would come over the speaker and be like, we have bad news. It's kind of like Madagascar too or whatever. He's like, I got, we got good news, bad news. Good news is we're landing. Bad news is an emergency landing. He's like, you're in the plane. You're crashing. You're going down. And obviously people would be panicking. He said, but I got good news. Underneath everybody's seat, there's a parachute. Let's just assume you know how to use a parachute. There's a parachute. And you're like, oh, I feel so much better about this. And you're on the plane, you quit panicking, and you crash and die, knowing and believing you had a parachute that could save your life. It's not enough to know and believe. It's giving your life to Jesus is the equivalent of taking that parachute, putting it on, jumping out, pulling the cord, and letting it save you. Giving your life to Jesus isn't a magical thing in the sense of 
It's you got to say the right words. Then you got to have the right things in your house, and you got to put three crosses in so many rooms, and you'll be fine. It's simply, it's miraculous, but it's simply just saying in Romans 10, I believe in my heart that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he was born of the Virgin Mary. I believe that he, he lived a sinless life. I believe that his life was a test by miracles. I believe that he died on the cross, not for any wrong he did, any sin he did, but he died on the cross for my sin. It's a personal thing. Yes, it's the world's sin, but he died for my sin. He died for your sin. He didn't die a gentle, peaceful death in his sleep and just passed. He was brutally tortured for your healing, your deliverance, your salvation. On a cross, publicly humiliated. I don't like being called out for doing a bad job at work. I couldn't imagine being stripped naked in public and hung on a cross. It wasn't something gentle with a few people at like an electric chair. He was treated as a criminal. He was buried in a tomb for three days. Dead. I know some people are like, oh, was he really dead? He was dead. How God dies, I don't know. There's faith involved. But dead, three days in the tomb. And three days later, the miracle that everybody wants to talk about on Easter, that we can remember every day, he came out of the tomb alive paid the sins for you and I that we could have life forever walked wasn't just he went, He then went to heaven he stayed another 40 days his life showing and revealing he is real, he went to heaven and said one day I'm coming back for you, if you believe that and say with your mouth you confess in your mouth that Jesus you're my Lord, you're my Savior yeah we call, we have a prayer I'll pray with you in just a second but if you believe that in your heart you pray that, that is how you put the parachute on Jump off the planet cord. Hold the cord and you're saved. Coming into church for 20 years will not make you a Christian. Sitting there, reading your Bible won't make you a Christian. It's when you say, God, I'm not able to do it on my own. I need you. Here's the thing, though, that's really hard. It's easy to say, I want to be saved. It's hard to realize what that means. Because if you don't really want to give your life to Jesus... You don't really actually like the idea of relying on him and trusting him. You just want the, the free, it's like Monopoly, the get out of jail free card. I have that and that's all you're looking for. That's not salvation. It's a transformation of going from where I was saying I'm dead to myself and I'm going to be new over here, new life in Christ. So if you're like, I need that. I'm not just looking to get out of hell for free. I need my life changed by Jesus. It's, been not, it's not working for me over here. I need something different than today's your day. Today's your opportunity. Maybe for you, you're like, I know I'm going to heaven. I don't need salvation. I just know what's going on in my life right now is not working. Today's your day too. Maybe you feel like what Pastor Jeff was talking about. You just feel like your life is under pressure and things are falling apart. Relationships are fracturing. Today's your day too. Because we might not know the answers, we might not understand why we're going through what we're going through, but God sees it and he knows like the story that he brought to remembrance earlier with the marble and the chiseling going on. He knows what he's making out of you. And it's something good and glorious and beautiful and wonderful. And it's not meant for your harm, but it is meant for your good. And so this morning, if you're on the first one I was talking about, you're like, I don't even have the relationship with Jesus. I don't even know if I would go to heaven. Then this would be a great opportunity to just say, hey, in a few seconds, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I know the whole thing. Close your eyes. Let's not be embarrassed. But I feel like and believe when we make a declaration publicly, it means more. I can sit in my bedroom all day long, and when there's an altar call going, and they're like, hey, do you struggle with this? And slip my hand up all day. It's different when you're in a room full of people and I can look around and other people going around like, you know what? But sometimes that's what we need. We need to say, I know I need this. And so in just a second, I'm going to say, if that's you, if you're like, I know I need Jesus and I'm not going to make it to heaven if I were to die today. I'm not just looking to get out of hell. I'm looking for my life to be changed and transformed. I actually want to know what it's like to live out a life that you guys talk about every Sunday, every Wednesday. I want that. Then I'm going to give you an opportunity here in just a second. Then 
for the rest of you, or if that was you prayed that and you still need the other, we're going to open up the altars. I'm just going to ask you to take a few minutes and say, God, I need your help because I realize that this pressure in my life, this challenge in my life is tearing me apart, figuratively and somewhat literally at times. So if you need salvation, if you're like, I need Jesus, just right now, can you just slip your hand up and say, that's me. If you're online and you're just listening to this even later, you just put that in the chat. Like, I need that. Somebody will reach out to you. Does anybody in here say, yes, today is my day. I need to walk across that line and say, I need Jesus. I need to give my life over to him. Okay, I'm going to take it with nobody's hands going up. Either it's very hard. I understand that. I remember getting water baptized in front of like 3,000 people. That terrified me. I get it. For the rest of you, though, since I'm assuming you're saved, if you're in this room online, if you're, if you're already saved, the altars are open. Let's just surrender to God the things that are, that are hard on us. Let's just move and go to God and say, God, I can't do it on my own. I need you this morning.
Lord, you are the way, the truth, and the life, and we just simply accept that in our lives. Lord, that we would see your path and not stray to the left or to the right, but just stay straight on the path you lay before us so that we can walk in the absolute freedom that comes from your spirit. But Lord, as we just make a diversion that you truly are the way maker as we go out, Lord, we just declare that in song prophetically, Lord, as we look for your way, because it's the only way of life. Pray this in your name, Jesus, amen. If you could just sing this as a benediction, we're just going to declare God is our way maker as we get ready to leave. as you go out though and make a difference in the world. Amen. Amen. That's right.